Welcome back to the $1 million Tipping Point podcast. Today on our show, we have someone named Lisa Phillips. Now, just as a reminder, you can find me on Instagram at Virtually Kiri or on LinkedIn. You can go to Kiri Mohan. I'm, I think, one of the only two out there on LinkedIn. And please sign up for our email community, the Tipping Jar of Wisdom. You'll get sneak peeks at guests, actionable items we work on each week to grow our business to seven figures and beyond. So again, today we've got Lisa Phillips. She is an international best-selling author, real estate investor, and the founder of Affordable Real Estate Investments. Lisa helps Black professionals with middle-income jobs understand how to buy and rent out homes whose value has sunk to under $30,000, typically in majority Black and brown neighborhoods. Lisa's clients are putting money back into their communities, which brings up everyone's value. They're not just talking the talk, they're walking the walk. So thank you again for being on the show. And I'm very interested in getting into this because I've had other real estate um, women on my show, but never anyone specifically, you know, talking about how do you get into real estate and buying real estate under $30,000 and making a profit for that. So this is going to be really interesting. Um, I did look back in your background a little bit, and I saw that you're originally an electrical engineer. So yeah. can you tell me how you managed to morph into this real estate journey? Yeah. um, First, thank you for having me on. I am honored. This is such an amazing platform and I'm glad you reached out. I'm such a fan. Um, I'd also like to say as far as, um, you know, my electrical engineering background (laughs) and and I just, uh, another point I wanted to say, I usually go on podcasts to talk about real estate investing. So I love the fact that I can talk about the business behind growing a platform coaching and real estate investing. Cause to me, that's, that's where a lot of the growth happened, not the real estate. That's been easy for the last 10 years, but growing an online business, listen, it takes a lot. So uh, my background in electrical engineering, I graduated from UNLV with that degree. I had about three different internships. You got to understand, um, I grew up working class. And when I went to college, I was on my hustle mode. It was like, we need to make money. I need to know what I'm doing. I need to get a career. I didn't take what I, I wanted to take dance, but like, no, I was not giving myself that luxury. It was very factual, very fact-based, where are we going to make money, very logical. So I had a few internships, um, one in like power, one in like electronics, and one in research. But um, when I graduated, even though I loved the degree, which helped me be very analytical, which so I highly recommend for that, um, and very creative in its own way, I didn't really like what the job scene was lo- was like because I was very social and the environments I was going into were not. It was a bit um, just conservative. Um, I def. I was gonna say when I think electrical engineering, I don't think of a very social job. Yeah, <laughs> and, and there's no thinking bad about it, but the environment is very. The type of people who are in that field are very serious, very serious minded, which is good. You need that, but um, I just have gifts of being able to work with people. I'm really good at customer service, which I use extensively in my business. Right, I'm really good at you know being of service to people, um, and I like talking and engaging and having fun. Right during the way, so. I jumped into technical sales and I did that for 10 years and I liked it and I learned a lot about working with clients and customers, which was great. But in corporate America, as I tell people, I did not fit in. I had a working class, lower income, um, black culture, um, uh, classisms, you know what I mean? Like that was my my class was working class. And when you get into corporate America, it is an upper class type culture. And if you're not used to that, it's a real big clash. And what I look back and see now, they sort of know that so they can get you at a low price and not promote you because, oh, she just doesn't do things the way we do, right? Mm. And they know what they're doing. They capitalize off of that class difference. But me not having anyone to groom me, to teach me, or to to guide me, I knew I was smart, I knew I was capable, but I wasn't being groomed, right? And so for me, I was like, okay, I need to find a way out because I'm not doing this. These people are not going to stay above me. They're not going to lord it above me. Um, I'm just too brilliant for this. And if they can't see it nor want to groom me for it, I got to get going. And um, I sort of started looking things in my price range. <laughs> so in my price range were properties in minority, black and brown, lower income neighborhoods that I came from. But it wasn't as hard for me to navigate them because I understand the people. A lot of people go wrong because they don't understand the clientele. You don't understand the clientele, you're not going to service them properly. But that's not a problem for me. My family still lives in the hood, as they say. So like, it's not a big deal. So I just started doing what I could do with the funds I had, which were more modest. 
but that actually worked. And what I did after that was like, okay, I bought my first property. I was like, okay, let me do it again. I bought my second property. I was like, okay, let me do it again. I bought my third and I was like, let me start telling people. Cause I know, especially, and I focus on black professionals. There's a lot of us in this corporate world who are not, um, jiving we're not integrating well they want to use our they want to use our mind they want to use our um, abilities but they don't want to groom us for positions of powers nor take the time for it and i and i think like i say they capitalize off of those class differences um very strategically um and i'm like there's people like me out there who are brilliant we don't just we don't need to do this you know and so i just started going on i was like where do i go to the library and start doing like just seminars on this or then I was like oh YouTube so I got on YouTube in 2013 and like YouTube is still like it wasn't as big as it is now mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in 2013 when I started just sort of laying this down for people um but I was like okay you know I'm just gonna put it out there because I know there's people like me who have abilities and really good talents it's just not, it's being um like preyed upon but not capitalized or I don't know what you want to call it but we're not being for how much we can bring to the table, we're not being put in positions or or just have the abilities to navigate that social scene in a way that we need to, to be as successful outwardly as we are inwardly. And for them, I put this out. So that's why I really just target that demographic because some of us are first generation college. This is our first professional job. There is some things that we don't know about corporate culture and no one wants to teach us. So. Um, it's just a really big clash with very capable and talented people. So that's sort of the story of how we got here. But how did you decide to go into real estate? I just feel like that's like, it's such an, I don't know, I, I guess maybe. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like, like, like I understand that you like, were like, okay, this is a wake up call. I need to get out of corporate America. Out. I'm going to use my talents. Yes. But when you have all these talents, we, like you picked real estate, why real estate? Good question. So that sort of goes into, I I mean, everyone loves real estate. And in when I was graduating in around 2004 in Las Vegas, everything was HGTV for the last five years. I was in Las Vegas, which went from like houses that were 100,000 to 400,000. So I was in this mania and bubble, which popped. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like at that young age, you're seeing people make money left and right. You're loving HGTV. You don't even have a house. You live in an apartment, but you love HGTV. Like I, I still I, do. <laughs> I, right. Like I, I just love the transformation. So there's a love that sort of gets in you for housing. And then you see the money people are making. You hear about it. So I was a victim, but it was okay. A good victim because I learned from it of like the 2006 crash. Because in 2004, when I graduated, I went out and I got a house and I paid way too much and I didn't know what I did now and it was overpriced and overvalued by double of what it should have been. But because of all this money coming in and that bubble, I was like, well, it's just going to keep going up. Like I haven't seen this for the last five years. Right. So, and that's normal real estate advice too. like your house yeah. is just going to keep right. That is like, normal. This... You are correct, Carrie. So there's <laughs> layers of um, layers of why someone new would buy into this and see it happening and not really understand bubbles, right? I do now, because I had to learn from that experience, but I purchased really high and um, everything crashed. <laughs> so I lost, my house had lost half its value. Mm. And it was already too expensive for me anyways. Like it took like, um, it was more than one paycheck to pay for it. Now I know don't ever do that again. I know a lot of things now about buying um, that I've, you know, that I've learned since then. And I, you know, I lost a job during the bubble. And then I got another one in Ohio. And before, and then I was in Ohio for a year and a half and I had rented out the Vegas house because that was the only place I found a job that I wanted to take. And I had purchased a condo for like 35,000, again, in a working class neighborhood. So I was quite comfortable with it. And then I lost that job. And then I had to let that other home in Vegas go. So you gotta understand, it was like, it lost half its value. Um, I was 27. It lost half its value. I lost the second job, you know, because mm -hmm. you're new entry level in Ohio. I was at the place. It just when you're entry level in certain states, like you're just not getting any action. Certain states have a plethora of jobs. Certain states don't. Certain states have a plethora of jobs in your field. Other states don't. So I just wasn't finding anything. So I had to let the house go to foreclosure. And my thoughts were, well, I guess I can't get a house for seven years. I guess I'll just buy thirty five thousand dollar condos like this. <laughs> Now it's different. It's not still $30,000. I've been doing this for 10 years and people have been listening. So it's definitely shifted up. 
Um, and it definitely depends on where you are, um, if you should buy or not, because there's 50, now it's 30 to 55,000. And it really depends on where you are, because there's some markets I would not recommend at all you purchase and investors find out the hard way that you still need to have a level of discernment. But because I had purchased that 35K one, and I was so comfortable in it, and I lost my job, but I was okay because like the mortgage was pretty low. It was something that said, well, okay, I can't get another house for all this time, but I, I was renting this one out. So I was unemployed, but I had a roommate. Um, between that and like the small jobs I did for fun, I had more than enough to live. And I was like, there's really a lot of value in owning these low cost homes. Like if you ever, if you're new and out of school and you lose your job and you lose a house of foreclosure and you're still in your twenties, it was like a really comforting feeling to see that if you own property, if you own property, it doesn't matter at what price point, you really can be well off against the economic downturn. So that was a very, very, very visceral, real lived in lesson. And so I eventually got a job maybe six months later after I lost the first one in DC. And I was like, I said, seven years, I can't do this, but I was making like 70,000. So I was like, well, you know what? I'll just save up half my paycheck because you do stuff like that when you're young and you don't have kids. And I'll just buy a house a year. And, and I, I bought like one every other year. But um, it sort of started something where I was like, okay, passive income, I can afford this. These are in lower income neighborhoods. I'm not into gentrification. So I'm just telling your audience right now, if you reach out to me and you want to flip in this poor neighborhood, like, like don't come to me. I'm not mm -hmm. going to help you um, because there is some level of social responsibility that I lead and I lead mm -hmm. the people who follow me and the people who follow me generally go, I agree with that. Like I used to live in this neighborhood we don't need people coming and pushing them out nowhere to go. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll just put that out there because people, their eyeballs get really big, but then greed takes over. And I'm just, this is about money, but money isn't everything. Your energy does matter, you know? So that's sort of how I got from this to this. And it was all about passive income. So I'm all about freedom. Doesn't matter what it is. Time freedom, house freedom. I told you, I don't open my clock until 12 o'clock in the afternoon. That That's the business freedom I created. And some people are like pinging me at like nine, not you, but like in general, they're like, hey, aren't you up? And I'm like, no, no, I don't <laughs> work until 12. I'm sorry if it's an emergency, but I'm really into freedom. So passive income to me is like the most freedom loving type of um, income you can get. And since then I've, I've went into like book passive income with selling books and selling online courses and having a monthly membership. But that's the leap to real estate because it was actually okay. quite real, um, as long as you're comfortable in low income neighborhoods. And it's so amazing when I talk to other women on this show, they condense like years into like <laughs> three minutes. And I'm like, well, there was a struggle there, right? Like, I didn't mean there you're was. saying like, it sounds like, you know, you lost a job, you lost, you went to Ohio, you lost another job. So like, there must've been moments in there when you were like, oh my God, what do I do next? Am I doing the right thing? But now we see like, uh, so I was looking into you and you've got the real estate business where you're teaching other women to do this, the membership, et cetera. It looks like you're also into crypto, energetic healing, yes, and of I, course, you're an author. I'm, I'm a bit multidimensional. Yeah, the crypto came because I started on my own because everything starts with me just doing it for me, getting to some level of success and going, well, I got to put this out there. So let me just network with people and see what I can do. So yes, I did actually. So from 2013 till now, it's the real estate. But in 2017, on my own, I just started getting into crypto. I went, I bought on the up and then it crashed and I held on. And then three, four years later, I was like, oh, like 15,000 turned into $130,000. Okay, Amazing. this is the thing, right? And I did it very like, very conservatively, very logically, but just being able to have the vision for me. And, 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 I, and I stand on this, it's the future. I say crypto is to money the way Netflix is to Blockbuster. Um, mm. So you can wait as long as you want, but for me, I'm like it's already proven itself to me. I'm in it, and I and I really want, you know, ep, you know, I do focus on the black community, like spiritually. That's like who I'm here to serve. Like that's the reason I look like this. That's the reason I'm able to accomplish what I am to bring it back and help those who want to do it. And so I brought it back to them, like, hey, this is what you want to do. Trust me. Very little investment over time, and with strategy, can yield very big results. Um, so I started just doing that just because I wanted to, and the spirituality is also on my own. I just really delve into developing my spiritual gifts and abilities, um, which, you know, are varied for every person. And then once I got to a level of mastery where I've healed a lot myself, I just offered it to the public, like for those who are at this advanced level 
and you want to step more fully into your spiritual gifts and your your sort of your goddess like energy your ability to manifest and create i am willing to help you so i just put it out there and whoever mysteriously finds the message finds the message that's what i love about when I interview, I call them like multipreneurs, right? That have many different yes. branches. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're not scared to just say, I'm going to just put it out there. This is what I love. And I love doing this. And that's, I, I am exactly the same way. Like I have a few things going on. I just, I'm like, let's just see where it goes. I'm going to throw it out there and hopefully someone finds it. And hopefully, hopefully someone comes to me and I've done energetic healing. And my mm-hmm. husband laughs at me. My oh, friends yeah. laugh at me, oh, yeah. but I have had results oh, that are amazing. That are absolutely amazing. And I, and I get it. And some of me is like, maybe you have to be a willing participant. Maybe you have to go into the energetic healing session, will like wanting to be changed. Maybe it doesn't work if you go in and you're like, you could probably speak more to this than me. But if like my reluctant friend who makes fun of me all the time, if he went in, would he see any difference or no? Because he's blocked off. What do you think on that? I mean, he would with me, but I'm a very high yeah. level. <laughs> I'm very high level. Like I shift energy very strongly. So I, um, so it, he would with me, but maybe someone who as is, who's at a maybe beginner stage in their energy uh, manipulation, which FYI, I honestly low-key think that's why I went into electrical engineering because I understand energy at like a very scientific and physical way, but I also understand it metaphysically. Um, So yeah, with a very strong practitioner, everyone believes because at the end of the day, you have no choice. You're feeling the energy move through you, Mm. right? So with a very strong practitioner who's very activated, Um, but you know, the look on their faces when I say, well, I'm psychic, Uh huh. Uh huh. And then and then it's either uh huh, right? And then they slowly back away, or it's like, well, can you tell me this? Tell me more. Here, tell me a little bit. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you want to know? You know. Uh. Okay. So when did you start like hiring a team and starting to decide? You know what? I'm doing too much on my what? own. I need to get a little bit further. With real estate investing, you can sort of do that on their own. But it's when I started building this platform, um, teaching people how to recreate the results that I had that's when it did and it was about four years in so from 2013 2017 i started really going into how do i get more freedom and i actually linked up with a mentor her name was stephanie nicklich and she was really big for like a hot moment where she was all about like um passive income and automated income and she was a really expensive business coach i think i paid like thirty thousand for the year which for a girl from the hood that is a that that is a honda civic okay that is a lot of money that's like more money than a honda isn't that more money than i don't know there's there's cars under 30 grand right now (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. so i mean that's a lot of money for me but i invested and um that experience she was all about the you know automated passive and outsourcing and Mm. i learned a lot of skills from her so i will be honest like i came up with my own things but a lot came from her on hiring people. And I remember she gave me advice on like SOPs. Like, why are you still doing your email? Hire someone to do your email. She looked at me like I was crazy. And when someone looks at you crazy for like, why are you still doing your own email? You're like, uh, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be doing my own email. And then, um, so I, to this day, I still have someone who does my email. She does like low hanging fruit. So I can focus on the big stuff, like clearing out receipts, putting in my receipt folder, responding to customer service. Um, and, um, and then I, you know, it just started outsourcing. And the one key thing she taught me that, um, I think a lot of women don't necessarily do SOP standard operating procedures. So I will, and I made my own where I'll do like a word document for like a email assistant, email assistant, level one, level two, and level three. And if I get a new person, I can show her email number one, where it has written instructions. And then I have like a video screen job job showing where it is Mm -hmm. and that's been a game changer so pretty much whenever i hire someone even if they're new i can give them my sop with me doing a video capture and that's really big because as you know turnover can come they stick with me for some time because i just i don't know i give them a task they do it and and it's like maybe they're like i got a full-time job now and so then they go but things like that are game changers so i can go in and out pretty smoothly with hiring and mostly virtual assistants um, from all over the country just depending on the skill level and skill set Okay. My background is a virtual assistant. So I, yeah, I love hearing that. Very important. Yep. 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 Whole team. So what, so then was your first hire someone who did your emails? Um, yes, yes. I have so many I have graphic artists who are on sort of, 
so when you work with a freelancer, they sort of just hang out and you just go, hey, can you do this? And they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just pay. And so you just keep going back. So they're not like an employee, but they're your person and they know your business. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so a graphic designer, email person, um, bookkeeper, um, someone to automate all the. So I automate as much as I can. So I don't have to do it manually some things I haven't been able to automate. So someone like every time I do a group coaching call, she archives it and does this and sets it up here. Or when I do a podcast, she takes it, takes the MP3 and then loads it up to her, to my podcast. So I have general admin as well. Um, even ghostwriters um, for my books. Like I do the written content and then they, you know, make it nice, write it out, smooth it out a little bit. So it's not exactly like you're talking. Um, so yeah, all sorts, all sorts of admin. I can keep, you want me to keep going? I have social media. I tell them exactly what to do with the social media, um, and how to post things or where to post it. Um, a few email marketing, um, as assistants when I need it. And I just don't feel like pulling it out of my own head. So the list goes on pretty much. I try to do the least amount in my business as possible. I need to get someone to give me a podcast. So I need a podcast searcher finder <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to find a podcast for you to be on. Yes, my <laughs> podcast manager does that for me once a month. She's great. But, so I can be doing that too. Do you know uh, this? You might not know us off the top of your head, which is fine. But do you know the ratio of what you probably or like percentages of what you spend on your team versus other investments and versus what you bring in? Oh, gosh, it's just about, okay, versus other expenses. It's almost equal. Okay. So, so all their expenses for like our audience might be like, you know, platforms, email, it might be blue, software, mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. This automated thing or this thing I signed up yep. for. Hootsuite. Yeah. All of that. I would say it's equal to what I pay my virtual assistants. Okay. They're on the same level for me. I don't have like a ton of like, um, software costs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is pretty reasonable. And that's what's nice about running an online business because it's similar to me. Like the, the costs are pretty low. Well, for me, at least yes, the, the contractors are higher than the software. Yes. Yeah. It can be like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. What challenges have you had when growing your team and what advice would you have for other women? The, uh, the only challenge is actually sitting the time to write up and like a like what you actually want. Um, I work with people who are American, but those who are like English second language in other countries. So it's just getting the time to write it down and and put it on paper. It's worth it before hiring and then trying to explain it all. If you just write everything that you need, be very clear, and concise. When you are surfing them, I literally send them the document and go, "Can you do this?" And mm. it's all written down. I see they've, I use Loom, Loom, mm -hmm. L-O-O-M for my screencast. I can see when someone reads it, you know what I mean? Like, so I know that they're reading it. Um, So that's the biggest thing, but like the SOP and like writing everything down with clear instructions is a game changer. So once I did that, I honestly don't have any problems, even if they're brand new, because they know exactly what to do. The Loom is key. I realized that too, because it cuts down on phone calls and Zooms and stuff like that. So for our audience who doesn't know Loom, it's just like Lisa's saying, it's a screen share. You record your screen and what you're doing. But when you have higher and it's something that's repetitive that like really they can learn by themselves if they just had a quick tutorial. It's yeah. just so perfect for that. It's so perfect for that. It takes like two minutes for the loom. It actually takes me longer to write it down on Word than to just describe it. And they loom. have a, a free account too for like yeah, they videos do. under five yeah. minutes. I pay, really that's nice. one of my expenses. I do pay because I, I do longer videos sometimes. I do pay for the upgrade if they got me, but they've been an excellent helper tool for an online business owner who hires a lot of workers. Um, but yeah. So let's talk about a little bit. Um, when you hit your first 100K, you did drop that you were making 70,000 at one point. So when you start building your own business, I feel like there are some significant milestones, right? Yes. There's 100,000, 500,000, and then there's a million when you get yes. there. So <laughs> what? when did you hit your first 100K? Okay. All right. <laughs> so I had, I was doing the online coaching and I was working full time. I was actually starting getting to people who are like, I will pay you. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, when you start and you charge like 350 a month, like you remember those days? We all did yep. it. 
Yep. <laughs> I, I was just turn, thinking turn. about this yesterday. I was just thinking about this yesterday. I had an old client reach out to me and I was like, baby, honey, you can't afford me now. That happened to well, me. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I, I was like, how do I say now. this politely? But when we first worked together, I charged you 400 a month. Like you were yeah. one of my first clients. It's yeah. not going to happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I had three clients like that. And I had... Uh, so- me losing my corporate jobs is the story of the of like the year for me. So like, yeah, so I was charging 300. It was part time, but I was like getting these testimonials and I was I was proving to myself that this is something I can do. I can take people from here to cash flowing property and they're happy. You need those $350 clients and they're smart for taking you up on it. So I had like three or four. And I remember I had lost my job again, which I was okay with at this time. It was 2015. I had these properties and investments. So I didn't, because I had the investments and I was making about 1800 in cash flow from my few properties. We had three at the time. And I was making that, that in cash flow that I could use to live off of. And then we were Airbnb our house, like the downstairs. I bought a house specifically as something I could Airbnb part time. See, one of those lessons learned um, from the first time. And um, we were making like 1800 so I didn't have to rush out. So real estate has given me this freedom where I didn't have to rush out and get another job in order to maintain myself. And so I lost the job again. It was like layoff. And I had saw an ad, and this was so God sent. I saw an ad from a guy on Facebook, and he's like, I can give you five clients a month. And I'm like, five clients a month? That's so cool because at 350 a piece, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's cute <laughs> so I was like yo that's livable like I don't have to rush out and get in with my investments and this I will be and I would be right remember I come from working class background I can be poor and be okay you just shop at the thrift store and you know you go to Chili's and not look at the state like you can do this right mm-hmm. you know like I can be I can have a lower income and still be happy that was my background which I really appreciate because it made tough times not not hard at all um and so uh I saw this coach. So he was the reason why I paid that other lady the money. And I remember going to him and we had a 45 minute strategy session and he said $5,000, which was so much when I had that saved when I was laid off. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this. But he got me from like 350 a month to 15,000. So he was like, what are you charging? You teach people how to do what? He was from Canada. You mean I can take my money because he had a lot more than $15,000 in the bank, right? He had a lot more yeah. than that. And you mean you could show me how to buy houses for how much? And he was, I, I'm pretty sure he's a millionaire at that point. He definitely is now, but I'm pretty sure at that point because he had clients like this all the time. And he was like, girl, charge more. I was like, I don't think I can to my audience. And so I spent eight weeks with him, but he was like, this is what you do. This is how you present it. This is how you set it up. Da, 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 da. And he was amazing. And he got me to the 15K a month. And it's been pretty much that. I mean, it wiggles, of course, back and forth, depending on how many leads I get each month. But he got me to that point and I stayed there. And that was in 2015 and onward. So, so that was a good investment. That $5,000. And um, it gave me the understanding that a great coach is so worth it. I will say that I'm sort of intuitive, so I haven't chosen bad coaches, and I know some people out there have, so I do feel bad for that. I do believe in, that I, I advocate strongly for coaching and mentoring, um, but I do know some people have bad experiences because they're not all um, people of integrity, they're people of greed. So I do feel for you guys who sort of back away or had bad experiences, I feel for you, because there are good ones out there, right? Do you and- wanna drop his name so we can put it in the show notes or no? It is. His name is Jason Nyback. J A S O N N Y B A C K. He's out of like Calgary in Canada. He used to be like a minister. All of my best like business coaches used to be ministers because I've had like two. They're like, <laughs> and there's something about the spiritual aspect, I guess, that um, we gravitate towards each other. But, um, but yeah, he's great. I would rec- I still call him just to be like, hey, Jason, how are you? And I think he just looked at me like, yeah, like, what are you doing? <laughs> but he was super nice. And I don't know, really great relationship I had with him. So highly recommend him if you want to reach out highly until this day. Um, I highly recommend him. And that was really big. So that was like the big jumping point for me understanding what it took to have that, you know, now I wish they had business coaches like that in the corporate world, like where would I be, but I mm. need to be here as an entrepreneur and I need to be servicing and helping the people I'm doing. 
but it just goes to show like when you're groomed and showed the ropes by the right person there's like you can succeed in whatever you do i think corporate companies are starting to invest more in that and getting coaching programs for their employees because there's been a strong demand from when you left the workforce and one of the people i interviewed actually had a company where she it was for salespeople, but they would help develop and coach and mentor them to become better at their craft and to succeed more. And so I, I think there's definitely a demand out there. And I think people are starting to be like, well, why can't I have a business coach even though I'm in the corporate world and just you, you don't know doing the crap. Yeah. Because you think business coach, you think someone who runs a business, right? Right. But if I would have had someone I could pay, oh, you'll teach me how to navigate politics, upper class uh, culture, show me where I'm going wrong. I can tell mm -hmm. you what, what's happening and how to, oh, you know, this is who you want to talk to in the organization. You want to talk to this person, but ignore this person. Like I would have, you know, we all could have succeeded very well, but you know, I know what I know now from 10 years of being in business, right? Mm -hmm. Now, like, if I went to corporate America, I'd be the CEO within, like, what, a year? Like, but now, but that was 10 years of me grooming my own business and, um, you know, reaching out, you know, that I Have you ever about. thought about, since you're a multipreneur, filling that need, trying to learn more about corporate and how you can help other women of color in the corporate world and be a coach yourself? I mean, not that you don't have enough on your plate. You have plenty on your plate. <laughs> But you seem so passionate about this. Yeah, right? like, no, I'm all about it. coaching them away from it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm all about coaching them out of it. Like, so I, you know, I do focus on the black community. So there are specific things. Like there's right now a thing called like the black woman exodus. Black women who are a general cornerstone of um, corporate America. Now I see it through a very logical lens and practical lens. Um, we get paid less, but you get our creativity, our power, our spunk. <laughs> You get all that, but we do make less than um, all of our counterparts, right? And that was real because I I was making 82 cents on the dollar of my, you know, white male coworker. You know, that was a real thing. And there's a lot of us like me who are leaving. And I actually, so I don't know where I stand on that because they were writing about it, I think in Forbes or Wall Street. So many black women are leaving the workforce to start their own businesses, but this is what they're coming into. Women like me who can teach them how to run online businesses successfully, who can teach them how to target and market the mm -hmm. client successfully, how to navigate, how to outsource. So they're not only leaving, but because of the work we've been doing and people like me, other black women for the last 10 years, they're going to really good coaches and mentors who can teach them how to do their own thing. Um, it's at a point now where black women start businesses at faster rates than white men. I don't, I don't know who was the leader, but we are now, right? And so they're entering into a world where they have the support and the network to sort of grow and flourish. So um, I guess I, I, I don't like, even though I'd love to help them navigate that, I think it's best we just leave and build our own things where we can appreciate our own um, efforts if we're not being appreciated in the workforce. And you have a lot going on. <laughs> you do. And a kid and a six year old. And a six year old. Oh my goodness. That, yep. Yeah, that's a lot. I have a six year old girl and it is. Uh... Well, I love her, but she takes all my energy. It's a challenge five right ten, now. <laughs> five to 10, don't talk to me. Like, uh, it's not happening. She is going to want to eat 18 million times. I will have to tell her to clean up. <laughs> like, she's just going to take my energy, but she's worth it. But, oh, yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the most important action you took to grow your business to 1 million? I was the business coaching. Okay. Hands down, because they showed me what I didn't know. They showed me how to structure it. They showed me how to charge what I'm worth. They showed me how to get leads. They showed me how to market, all of that. And each one was different. One was for automation and outsourcing. So you don't have to spend all that time in your business. So I work anywhere from two to four hours a day. And the other one was like, this is how you set up a really good coaching and robust program. And every single one of those were game changers who took me to a higher income. So that was, those were the keys element. Of course I did the work. And mm -hmm. it, it's me that sells it, right? But it was also me investing in sort of getting the parameters and the foundation and the structure in place that I didn't know I needed. And they helped with that because they were successful already. Did they help with your mindset at all? Did you think that you needed to adjust your mindset to take your business to the next level? No, I was always extra confident that like I can succeed. I, You know, I always held on to that like, anything is possible attitude that sometimes we lose you know now i'm 40 so i've taken a few hits so like now like anything's possible within reason whereas before that it was like anything's possible but when you have that and you really think that like with time and effort and dedication you can get to something um you you really don't need anyone to fit your mindset because you really truly believe that with time 
things will happen. And I'm, I'm just always been the biggest fan of like the, the, the fables, um, you know, slow and steady wins the race and the, and the hair, the turtle and the hair, like that's a story that really resonated with me as well as like the ant and the cricket, you know, like putting away for winter months. I know they're very too simple, like tales, but I, I truly, truly believed in them. And so I was like, if it takes 10 years, it'll take 10 years, right? Like I'm going to do it, but I was okay with that. I was actually going to ask you when you're talking, if you're the type of person who rushes to get everything done and get to the next level as fast as possible, or if you're someone who paces yourself and says like, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there and I'm going to do one thing each day or something. Paces. I pace. I can't. Yep. <laughs> um, what do you think is, taking out the coaches from the equation, what do you think would be the best investment for your business, right? Because, you know, you need to spend money, you need to make money and there's this constant push and pull. What was your yeah. best investment and what do you think was your worst? My best investment now, as I was like, I know my skill set, I know my thing, right? My expertise, I have I'm experienced in, in delivering results. Now, the biggest investment is anything deal with uh, branding and graphics and sort of the showmanship and artistry. Mm. I don't, it, I, I feel like it's effective now because I have what it takes to back it up. Like I could stand by it 10 years in this and all the hundreds of people I've worked with one-on-one. -on -one. Before, if I would have had all the flashy stuff, I would not have had the depth and breadth that I have now. It still would have worked, but it would have been on a shakier foundation than being 10 years in the game. So I say now, with the expertise that you really have, branding, showmanship, social media pushes, um, graphic designers, um, new website updates, which I do periodically, but the branding is part of it. So I didn't used to pay video editors, now I do it now, because I understand it does make a difference to draw people in that makes something exciting and attractive mm. looking. So that's a, a now thing that's really beneficial. Um, I'd say the worst investment, um, well, it's not the worst, but maybe I get the least out of it. Uh, I'm sorry, what? I can't think of anything that's a bad investment. It, that's all, good, I guess, like, that's good. They all have like, a, a, some have a really big output and some have a smaller output, but they're all necessary. What about in terms of mistakes and challenges you made while growing your business? Have you felt like you've made any mistakes or challenge that, you know, could I help did. others? I, you know, I sort of was a little snottier when I started. Like, oh, you can figure this out yourself. <laughs> some things, <laughs> not all things, some things, a little snottier, not, not totally, but a little bit. Like, I wouldn't respond to, like, social media posts. I was just a little like, well, I'm good, so you're going to just recognize that. And I really had to humble myself. And be like, listen, you treat everyone like they are an honored guest in your home. And um, that's something I had to learn. And when you do that, there's so much grace given to you by everyone and from everyone. And it's like an attractive quality that makes them want to work with you. So just really learning to humble myself and be a, more of service. Like I was of service, but like I'm not doing customer service email and I'd let my admin handle it, but she wouldn't handle it well. And like maybe waiting way too long before I'm like, okay. Because you got to understand, I, I moved to like only working three hours a day. So I'm looking at this like I don't want to answer that email. But like like going from like letting someone else do it to like I'm going to get in front of this and be a higher level of customer service is something I did not have. And I think that level of service is what carries you through everything. Um, that and uh, being accommodating. So the reason I have so much longevity is because I work with full-time professionals. They work full-time. So I have different things in my coaching program where if I'm working with them on an eight-week program and all of a sudden they have life comes up, I allow them to pause. They get one-time mm. courtesy pause and then they can come back at any time they want. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but I allow that. They understand it. If they can't make a meeting, they can send the questions ahead of time. I'll answer it on the group call and I'll send it back. So being very accommodating to your target audience Mine is like we're we're first we're, we're like first generation black professionals like listen like we have a lot on our plate you know like we're we're paying off student loans we're doing this we also have a family we want, we don't want to live in the worst part of town so we're paying lots of money for rent so I have to keep this job this job that I might not be a great fit for in corporate America and I'm making less than all my colleagues it's a lot right and so being very accommodating and coming up with fun packages where okay so let's say they talk to me and they want the coaching but you know my price tag you know. It's, you know, it's just a little too much for them. 
well, maybe that you could do this little bit of a training. And then if you like that, you can come to me and we'll credit you what you paid. It doesn't, there's no time limit, right? Not mm. with, you can do some more like, oh, within two months, you get back to me done. I don't do the hard sell. It's not necessary, but maybe I'm missing, I make enough for me. Maybe I'm missing some by not doing a hard sell, but I just leave it really open. So they're super comfortable with me, but my demographic needs to be comfortable because they've had people take advantage of them. Um, so little things like that, that's just making your, your me accommodating and flexible and understanding that people are real people. And not all of my clients are black professionals, like 20 to 30% now are not. And mm -hmm. they appreciate all of this accommodation because they just don't see it. It's a very strict and harsh energy out there sometimes with coaching. And I just don't have it because I don't need it. And so I'm like, yeah, if you need to take a break, you can, or if you want to put this down, so you get this training, see what you can do on your own. And if with this, you can go and you don't need me. But if you want to work with me, I credit you what you paid. You're not out of anything. Just accommodating to people's money concerns is going to help you. Um, payment plans are going to help. Um, and maybe you're very luxury and it's wealth, so they don't want to hear that. And so I'll just say I do work for people who have income, but they do appreciate this level of accommodation. I love the idea, actually, of having that training and then crediting that. That's really being flexible and, like, it's a good genius idea. I love those, like, yeah. oh, genius ideas that are putting Put uh, thanks. Thank Jason. <laughs> Jason coming Give up again. It to me 2015. I've been running with it. All right. So let's, let's think about like, you went back to marketing a little bit, um, in your branding. Is there any specific brand or not branding, but like marketing advice you would have for women who are trying to get to that um, million dollar point that you think really helped push your business? If you don't mind the expense, um, I would say if you're, I'm video based, right? That's how people find me. Um, paying for the video editing per video, which gets a little, you know, it's 20, 30, 40 bucks per video, which can be, I don't know. If you have the money, go ahead and do it. But it can be a little like, I don't want to pay that. You know, I do multiple videos, you know, a week, right? Like I don't want to pay for this expense. I would say um, things like that. Updating your website periodically, getting a new branding. Um, so, um, a concept I wasn't familiar with, and I don't find everyone is, is getting a brand board. Do you feel that your audience all know what brand boards are? I have heard of them, but please go into it for, I've not done them. Oh, I'd love to show you one. I can pull it up on my screen, but, um, now whenever I start a new business, I get like a brand board made. Um, so I get a graphic designer who knows how to do them and I go, Hey, this is the brand I want. Can you make a brand board? These are the colors I'm thinking of. And I'll show her a few images and they'll come up with a color, color palette that just really flows together because they have that artistic eye. And so anything I do, I can send. So I get new graphic artists all the time. I get them from everywhere. They may be new to me, but I give them the brand board and I say, these are the colors I want to use, or maybe I want to highlight the gold or the yellow or the blue. It has the hex code so they can get the exact color. Mm. Um, and so then you have this beautiful, it doesn't matter who the graphic designer is, you're getting this beautiful, cohesive look, feel, and brand. And you can update that. So I update it after five years, I update it. And so now I'm on a new brand board, but I might update again and go from a little bit more, especially since the spirituality, more masculine, straight, straight lines and straight houses and straight money to more of a feminine energy with like, you know, showing a little bit more decor and the housing and the rental properties, right? And so that's just my own evolution. So I say getting a brand board will really help as well. So you're gonna have a cohesion and it's just gonna start to look more attractive and nice. And it's just something that took me some time to do, but now I do it with everything and I notice a difference in how I'm presenting myself. So that's good. And then your social media posts as well. I do hire people from time to time to make like templates, like social media templates. So if I use mm. it, I can just go to Canva. They already made the templates, it's sitting there and I can just fill in the information, but it sort of has that look and feel. All and it's through. so useful in case they disappear. And if you disappear, <laughs> you yes, do? I mean, that's real. I hate to scare people, but I have had contractors just randomly disappear or honestly, something comes up where they get really sick and they, they can't even tell me and I'm waiting for something and I'm like, okay, okay, they're not responding. I just have to do it myself. And just being able to have that template and then go yeah. in and fix it. Just write the information and then you yep. got your posts and you can do yep. it yourself or hire someone. I actually need to hire a social media person to post right now anyway. So thanks for the reminder. Mm. I, I have someone who does that for me too. Nice. How, um, where do you plan to grow your business? What do you see in the future for yourself? That is such an interesting question, Carrie. So I've, I'm at the 10 year mark. I've been doing this for 10 years, 2013 to 2023. So 
I'm not in hustle mode anymore. Mm. I will admit. So this is part of, I'm going to say it on my behalf as a woman and now as a mother and having a six year old daughter, I'm not in hustle mode. My energy levels are not the same as they were in my early thirties, right? I'm more ginger with my energy. <laughs> so I do plan on growing, but it's definitely more on the spiritual side of things and energetic side in which I grow my business. So you're probably not gonna see me hustle, 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 hustle. I'm only taking, even though it would help my, so take this as you want. Um, I'm still getting more clients than I've ever had before, but I'm not hustling to get on every single podcast like I did in the beginning when I was growing it. Um, so I'm more strategic. So I'm writing a book versus doing the hustle tour, right? So I'm writing a second book because the book has a very large way of getting, so like half my clients come from my book rather than YouTube, oh, wow. social media, or my email list. Oh, it's wow. On Amazon it has um, it's like a thousand plus reviews. It's four and a half stars. It really resonates with my key audience. But like I said, people outside my key audience resonate with it, too, because it has like a morality to it or some integrity to it. And so I'm writing a second book. Right. So the hustle to just like do, do, do is sort of gone. And it's more like, well, let me pace myself, do a book in my own time, release that. And that will be on investing out of state because that's what I teach all work with all my clients because we generally don't invest where we live because it's too expensive, but like one or two states away, those are where the deals are and I teach them how to do it. Um, so we're gonna go through the book because the book has been a game changer. So I recommend it for anyone who wants to be an authority, get that book written. Um, and two, I just sort of use sort of more um, manifestation techniques to draw the people and clients and get an alignment and be an energetic match, which is a hard thing for people to like understand but I'm like, I did the work up front so I can relax more in the sort of like the masculine energy of like, uh, you know, uh, this was, you know, uh, go and, and put out this many posts and do this many videos and do that and talk to this many people, reach out to this many folks and, and see if you can do this and see if you can do that and see if you can do that. Like I was in that hustle mode and I did that for like eight years, the last two, definitely not. Um, but then after having a child, I'm just um, trying to build differently. So I hope, I don't know. So it's a little different. Uh, I hope that resonates with some of you guys who are more energetically sensitive and you just don't have the energy maybe you did in your youth. I don't feel I need to hustle anymore to grow and I'm I'm pretty comfortable with my results. So I just have a level of let go universe. Hey, you provide or you don't like, listen, I'm, uh, I don't have the hustle in me anymore, but I am still doing well. So um, it's actually coming back. Once some, it's something about surrender. We're like, whatever. <laughs> When it all comes to you, I don't know if anyone can. The longer you're in business, you too get you get more confident too, and you realize you've been through some ups and downs, and now you can like relax a little bit because if there is a down, there will be an up, and you know that. And I think I've I've learned that too. I'm I'm almost reaching. How oh, how many? Gosh, 2014, I started my business, so I'm almost there too. Like yeah, yeah. it's a big so milestone. It's like, that's a big milestone for me being 10 years in business. That is, that's huge. I've been five years with big, but I don't think I was as relaxed five years in business as I am now. Right. I think kids Which is eight years. It. So talking about to the woman thing, I mean, it's just, you have to make a switch. I had to make a switch when I had a kid and I'm okay with the switches. Um, I'm okay with less hustle. I feel like I backtracked when I first had my daughter and I was like, I wanted to show everyone I could do it. Mm -hmm. You know, have a child at home, have a flexible schedule, still keep my career, keep my business, et cetera. And then as time has gone on, I think as I've gone through those ups and downs and I've realized it's not worth it. Like right. the client's well, gonna go. get like super pissy about X, Y, Z. Like, why am I even working with you? Right. Like, that's not the life I want. And then I just kind of, I don't know. I, I had a business coach. I think he helped me a lot because I always had the sense of urgency of this, like, oh my God, I gotta get this on. I gotta get this on. And he just helped turn that off and helped me realize like, okay, it's fine. I don't need to be like that all the time. So I, I see where you're coming from. And I, I think it happens to women at different points in yeah. their business. Um, I love it. I love it. It's more chill. And uh, you've given us a lot of great things. Um, but what do you think, what hurdles have you faced specifically as a woman growing your business and specifically as a woman of color that you would, you've talked a little bit about this, but what advice would you have for that other, for other women out there? 
Well, you know, the being um, a black woman teaching black professionals has actually been great. So I would say for other black entrepreneurs out there, like focusing on your own people because there's your story matches theirs or they resonate with it. That's such a big thing, um, especially being in the black community like that. They say like the black community has millions in like spending power and like that's mostly with black women and that's like the majority of my clients and so um being a black woman specializing towards specific black professionals and being very open about that has been great for longevity and to keep me in business and to keep me on top of mind and for them to be very comfortable with me knowing that i focus on that so um i think if i was marketing and i actually did have this because I, I was marketing to everyone at first who was into real estate investing but i found that the only people who really resonated with my message everyone wanted to learn how to buy cheap houses but who actually paid me for my expertise were black professionals so that's when i started doing it and so i think you might have trouble if you're doing it to the broader sense because there are some cultural elements that are different you know there's some people in society who are not talking trying to go into a low income neighborhoods and nor do I want them to if they're not comfortable with it right so it's very interesting like being a black woman focusing on servicing a, a clientele that is also other black professionals has been really good for the longevity in my business I would say so that's the interesting part the woman part was actually okay because I am a woman but I know what I'm doing and I have expertise people love when I come in and I take leadership and ownership they, they want to follow strong women who know what they're doing um, if uh, an extra plus, if you can do it with grace and a little bit of, um, you know, ease with people and taking time and a little bit of nurturing, they actually really love it. So I have found that even in real estate investing and dealing with men and contractors and um, growing a business, it has been, I've noticed positive. As long as you come, you know what you want and you're really clear, which as a speaker, I just am very clear on my boundaries. So I would say that the biggest thing for me is being a mother being a mother has the let go is real and then all of a sudden i don't just take you like if i'm five minutes late for a meeting i can understand you being angry at that because your time is valuable but also understand my daughter was crying and like i had to attend to it and so i found that like there's certain clients who are very strict and very disciplined fell off and those with more grace are the ones that i attract and i'm okay with that so you know i've learned you know having a child made me go i don't need your money i don't need any you think i need any more stress pulling me and so being very sensitive to like i have enough you're not adding more has very much given me very firm boundaries about who i'll take money from and who i won't and that's a lot different than when i was a little bit more flexible before that so being a woman and a mother has had more of a just really strict discipline. And so even though I might be late, but I'm really disciplined about who I'll allow in. Like you have to give me grace and I give them grace. It goes back and forth, but that was really big on shaping where I am where I am now. Thank you. Can you share a little bit where we can find you and your book? I do have the title of that up here, um, Investing in Real Estate Property for Beginners. Yeah, invest- Available on Amazon. So share where we can find you, your membership, anything that you wanna share, crypto, energy healing, your membership. Affordable real estate investments.com. I do talk about the energy healing in the back of the book if you read all the way to the end. And you can get links for that if you want to learn more about your goddess and divine feminine energy. Um, but yeah, affordable real estate investments.com. I have access if you want a free copy of the book, just pay shipping and handling the monthly membership consultation, or just see case studies of people who are just normal people who went on to purchase four or five, six properties after working with me. And real stories, like as of like last month, like these aren't dated, you know, these are like, you know, I'm still current. So I'd love to have you or at least explore. It's not for everyone. And I'll also lead you to my cryptocurrency and I have free workshops on how to buy, buying your first crypto and just making it easy because I work in a workshop and people did Q&A. So you can hear me answer their questions. You probably have the same questions. So more than mm-hmm. happy to work with it. any of you guys out there or just let you know, get, get you some good resources. Great. What is one philosophy mantra or quote you try to run your business by? Oh, the one that has helped me was I learned this early. If it's not saving you time or making you money, don't do it. That has helped so much because when you have a list of 20 things to do, you have to prioritize it. Okay, well, I'm only doing this and this. This actually makes me money or saves me time. Ruthless prioritization. That's what one of my other guests said. 
once she said, ruthless prioritization, just make sure when you have a family, when you have kids, when you're running a business, you just have to make sure you're prioritizing everything. Or she said, outsourcing it. <laughs> if it's not in like your, where you want to spend your energy. Right. All right. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much. We will let you know when this is going to be aired and we're going to just um, promote this as much as possible. I so will. This you. is so fun. Oh gosh. Yeah. It was full yeah, of good yeah. advice. And I, I love having so many people from different walks of life on this business. Like this has been a totally different discussion on real estate than my, than someone else I interviewed, you know? Isn't that perfect? Yeah, it's great. It's great. So hopefully this will help other people and our audience in growing their business as well. And if they want to contact you, they know where to find you. So thank you. Thank you. Bye, Carrie.